Hey folks, Mike here. Thanks so much for clicking on the video. I've just been picking some blackberries ready to make some blackberry jam, but this video is all about bushcraft. In fact, I'd say it's probably one of the most informative and detailed bushcraft kind of tutorial videos on YouTube. It's a really good one. But before we get into it, I'd just like to say a huge thanks to Audible for sponsoring this episode. They sponsored some videos before. I really appreciate them helping out. When I was up on the Lake District, I had a five hour drive and that's a great opportunity for me to listen to audiobooks because I can obviously do it hands-free and I can keep my eyes on the road. Audible offers an unmatched selection of audiobooks with a huge range of different genres. Lately, I've come away from the kind of fantasy novels and I've got much more into uh, success stories on people who have gone out into the wilderness, something's gone wrong and then they've actually managed to deal with this situation and survive. The one I was listening to recently on my way to the Lake District is called Lost in the Wild, Danger and Survival in the North Woods. And it's actually about two different people. The first guy, I think it was 1998, he went out into the woods and he was leading a canoe expedition. And what he did was he was uh, crossing this gap between some cedar trees and he actually fell. He was out for four hours. I don't want to go into too much detail, but it, it tells you the story of how he survived that situation and they're just really thrilling riveting stories about these two guys and how they survived and it actually teaches you some good tips on what to do and what not to do uh, to survive in the woods it's been a personal favorite of mine this summer hopefully you guys enjoy that as well if you don't have audible they're actually offering you a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial just go to audible.com forward slash ta outdoors or text ta outdoors to 500 500 and you guys can download this audiobook and let me know what you think but thank you so much audible for sponsoring this episode there's links in the description if you guys are interested let's crack on with some bushcraft so i'm back out here in the woods in this video it's going to be packed full of bushcraft and survival tips not just advanced ones, basic tips as well. I'm here with Paul Kirtley, who you can see in the background. Paul runs Frontier Bushcraft, one of the leading UK bushcraft schools, and he has a wealth of knowledge. We are doing an overnighter. We're gonna set up camp later. The first thing we're gonna get straight into is ax technique. So I've come to speak to Paul, who's gonna give you guys all the tips about how to use an ax. Hey Mike, hey guys, I am just making sure the axes we've got out of stores are in good shape. We're here in an area where I teach bushcraft skills. It's a working woodland. It's where I teach my woodcraft course and it's the perfect setting for Mike to, to skill up with his um, axe and general campcraft skills. I'm looking forward to it. All right, that's uh, nice and sharp now. That's the Scandi axe that I've just been, just been touching up. And when they've been in, it was sharp when it was put away, but when they've been in stores a little while, they can uh, just lose their, their bite a bit. So I've just tickled it a little bit with the ceramic side of a, a DC4. What I think we need to do first, Mike, is start at the beginning and we'll look at some basic splitting techniques that are useful to people for firewood, because that's what a lot of guys and girls are gonna be using day in, day out. So let's get those day-to-day -day skills covered off first, then we can look at maybe some of the more dynamic stuff. So um, it's typical, isn't it, that it starts raining as soon as we start filming, but it is raining a little bit now, but we'll, we'll crack on. We've got a good uh, coverage of uh, leaves from the sweet chestnuts here. And what I'm doing is going around the sweet chestnut looking for some dead standing, because we want this for firewood for later. It isn't just a demo of how to split stuff. We actually want this. And what I'm trying to find is something that's reasonably consistent. And this seems quite hard, but on the other side here, it feels a little bit um, soft. Um, I guess it's getting more water here. So I'm just going to shave into it a bit and see see what we've got and yeah it's quite it's quite punky in here and in britain even though we've had a hot summer it's pretty wet most of the time and absorbent wood is never good because it's going to be full of moisture you can see where i've shaved it off this outer stuff that's actually quite wet and um, it is slightly um off the vertical and you're getting water on here and you can see that it's really quite soft and i can pick that away with my thumbnail so that's not going to make great firewood and that just goes to show how important it is when you're looking for dead standing wood that it's as vertical as possible because this side is pretty solid yeah it's solid on this side and it's slightly shaded here and um, this side it's got more water incident on it because it's slightly off the vertical and it's more rotten So this one seems pretty solid all the way around. It's pretty vertical. 
can see it's dead all the way up the top. So I'm not going to ax this. Um, it's more efficient to use the saw actually. I'm just going to use my Laplander. We're looking for stuff that you can hold with your hand. Been any complicated step cuts or anything here because it's a light piece of wood I can keep it under control just manually and it's pretty much vertical just nice and controlled just came to mind to share a little tip it's something that I do as a matter of course now but rather than just sawing it somewhere randomly I'm actually thinking about what am I going to use it for? And I'm going to saw it quite close to some of the knots because then it leaves the nice clean sections that are not free available for splitting. Whereas if I split it down the middle with a saw, if I could saw it through the middle there, then I'm left with two bits that have got knots in the middle, which is not so good for splitting. And particularly if we want to make feather sticks, for example, we don't want knots in the middle. is a little awkward I have to say I'm not you know making this up it is awkward to saw this small piece of wood on another quite slippery small piece of wood but this is often the situation we find ourselves in we don't have a saw horse we're not in a fixed camp so we need some techniques in our arsenal that we can make life a little bit easier and when you've got a long piece of wood that's got its own weight it will stay there I'm on my own here this is moving around it's hard for me to saw so a little little tip for you is we can keep the saw still and what we need is some way of keeping that saw still slightly flexible stick something like that is fine and then we're going to move the stick so that we want to saw the piece of wood rather than the actual saw sounds a bit questionable that but uh, It's a little bit punky, this is the top of the tree. Not so good quality, that's the bit that's been wet at the top. We can chuck it on the fire, but I'm not gonna to bother to split it. Well, I've got the Gransfors Small Forest Axe here, which is a very popular axe and there are other axes of a similar size. Vettelings used to make one, Hultafors make one this sort of size and it's about half the length from my fingertips to my sternum from one end of the axe to the other. It's very portable and it explains the, the popularity of these axes. There are a few safety issues that we need to consider. One is that because it's got a short handle um, it can easily come into contact with parts of my body rather than the ground if I'm swinging it standing up. So I tend to use it when I can kneeling down, whether that's felling or splitting. What we're going to look at here though is a typical situation that we all find ourselves in quite regularly. You've got your small forest axe or similar in the woods but you've got no chopping block, you've got no fixed camp, you've got some firewood, you've sourced your dead standing, we've sawn it up. I've got a length like a sort of baton about I don't know about 18 inches about 
40, 50 centimeters long as a minimum. So we want to be safe. And also if you're working around other people, you're setting a camp up, you don't want to be doing massive swinging axe splits. You want to be doing something that's quite controlled. So this is something we use on many of our camps and also we use it a lot on trips as well because you can do it just about anywhere. You can even do it on snow. All you need is a, is a bit of a log to work on and that could be part of what you felled. I'm gonna kneel because it's safe. Um, I'm gonna take the mask off my axe. I'm going to put that somewhere. A very common thing I see people do all the time with these nice brown natural coloured uh, masks for their axes is put them down on the ground. And I have, a, I have a problem with that in two ways. One is it's very kind of naturally camouflage. It blends in quite nicely. And secondly is, you know, I might stand on it. Somebody else might stand on it. It gets damaged, it gets dirty, it introduces grit to the axe. So I always try and put that in my pocket so I know where it is and it also doesn't get uh, damaged. Now I'm going to get myself a reasonable distance away from, from what I'm working on so that I can bring the end of the piece of wood down. I don't want to be so close that I'm all scrunched up. And then I'm going to place the axe on top of the wood. Now you should be able to see why I've chosen to cut the wood approximately the length that I have. It's just around the same length as the axe, which means that I can place both the bit of the axe, the, the working end of the axe, and the end of the, uh, the handle here, or the helve if you want to use the old English name, and I can put my hand in between. So I can hold the wood in my left. I'm right-handed, so I'll use my right hand, my dominant hand, to control the axe, and then I can place the two together, and I'm going to gently tap. I'm not going to try and split, just gently tap so the axe becomes embedded in the wood. And then once it's embedded, it's all seated in. I'm going to split, and I'm just going to prise the wood for it to, to split. If it doesn't split all the way, I can just tack it from the other end. the rain again. <laughs> That's about as dynamic as it gets. There's a natural split here which I'm going to try and utilize. Get the axe in there, just tap it again. And I'm using the weight of the axe largely to do the splitting. One thing that you should do, just get into the habit of doing when you're hand splitting like this is not to try and twist the axe because it could be embedded in what's below. It might be embedded in this. If you're using it on a stump, it definitely will be embedded at times. And what you don't want to be doing is putting undue stress on this meeting of the handle and the head. So we just get into the habit of holding that steady, holding the axe steady and turning the wood to prise that. So you're not just trying to turn the whole piece of wood underneath the stump or the block with the axe. It's just wasted effort and it stresses your axe. When we're splitting here, you've got a nice flat surface and you've got this curved surface. So I'm going to put the axe on the flat surface. It's easier to place it there than trying to get it to balance on that curved surface. So that's where I'm going to go here. I'm always trying to get the axe positioned over the piece of wood. I don't want to overstretch there. That's not as efficient. I want that to land directly above what I'm splitting on. So I have less of a target with a small piece of wood than say with a block and I want to be quite precise with that. Here however, now that I've split it, you can see if I put the axe on the inside I'm trying to balance it on the apex of that point there. It's easier comparatively to place the axe there so I'm going to quickly turn it around and do that. And this is something that becomes habit after a while but it just increases the efficiency. Here's another little tip, you may have noticed me doing this. The first couple of pieces I split, I put down on the ground as a base and then all the other bits that I'm splitting are going across that so they're up suspended off the deck. This is quite wet, we've had quite a bit of rain here in the last few days and um, it's generally good practice to, to do that. This nice dry wood on the inside of what I've been processing, this dead dry standing wood that I've been seeking out, I don't want to just throw it down in the wet ground. I'm putting it down 
with the dry side up and away from that wet ground. Got a nice straight grain, no real knots. There's the odd little pin knot in there, but if we wanted then to, you know, later on start making, you know, start making our feather sticks, that would be a nice. piece for that. And when I'm sawing, I'm bearing that in mind. I'm thinking about where do I want to saw this into sections so that I don't have knots in the middle. Imagine I got that knotty bit in the middle of that section. There's no way that I could create feather sticks. Whereas I've got this nice straight grained bit, there's no knots there. And it's the same whether you're using pine, willow, here we're using sweet chestnut and here comes the rain. So I'm not going to make many feather sticks now because they're just going to get wet. We'll make some more later on, Mike. Yeah. Maybe have a little feather stick <laughs> challenge later on. Yeah. I've got stuff that I can put down as a, as a hearth board to build my fire onto that's good fuel. And I've also got various different sizes of fuel, however much I want to process it down from the very fine stuff up to the chunkier stuff uh, for keeping my kettle going or what have you. It's good for frying on as well, split wood like this. If you, if you uh, want to put a frying pan on, you can quite, create quite a good crisscross fire lay uh, with wood that's all of about the same sort of diameter, like a sort of waffle shape. Here's a shorter one. So it's a bit shorter than the one that we've been looking at before. And so that might pose as a bit of an issue because we can't place the handle on. We're going to trap our fingers perhaps. So you're generally going to bring your hand a bit further back and bring the wood together with the, with the handle and then just tap it the same as before. Once it's in, we can do a bit more force. Shorter pieces will split more easily just because there's less to hold them together. Many a time I've hit my knuckle doing that. Doing that? That where you, you know, with a shorter piece and you've ended, I've ended up pinching it yeah, it's because you end in up there. with your knuckles there and then, yeah. you, then you go clang. Quite a common thing, I think, yeah, to do. It is. So get your hand a bit further back. What you can also do, I find it a little bit unstable, but what some people do is get both of their sets of fingers underneath and get their thumbs on the top and, and do it like that. And then there's no digits in between. Sure. Yeah, so that's another option. Some people really like that. Personally, I find it, I, I just like to hold the end of the, the handle if it's a bit shorter and just get my hand out of the way. So for those wondering why I'm not really on the camera much in this episode, that's because I wanted, I came here to see Paul because I want this to be as informative as possible for you guys. I want you to get as much information and absorb all that information. Some of you might know this already, some of you might not. So if you can pick up one or two tips from this video, then it's been worthwhile for me. Paul has a wealth of knowledge that what you're seeing now is a fraction of what Paul knows. Um, so if you're interested in obviously bushcraft and pushing your development, enhancing your knowledge, then you need to go to one of uh, Paul's courses on the Frontier Bushcraft courses. But yeah, so I'm not gonna be in this video too much at the moment. In a minute, I'm gonna have a go at doing these sort of things. I, I'm, I'm fairly used to doing them, but not with this size ax. I'm used to a smaller sort of hatchet, uh, but it's just, you know, getting information to you guys. So please carry on watching and absorb all this information that Paul's getting across because it's some very, very useful tips that will help enhance your bushcraft knowledge. It's pretty, pretty decent, some of this stuff, Mike. The, 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 yep. the thicker stuff from the base. The, the, the top was quite punky, you know, that's where it's yeah, been it's most exposed to the weather and spongy, isn't it? spongy on the outside, whereas this is further down and it's not rock solid, clearly, but it's really nice and Dense, solid, it? but it's dry. But one of the things with sweet chestnut is that when it burns down, you don't really get any bed of embers. So oak, for example, even willow, you get a reasonable bed of embers, but sweet chestnut, you just get ash. So it's, it's good for quick boils when it's split down. It's good for frying, but it's not good for roasting. Oh, so we'll use it to get our fire going. We'll use it to get the kettle boiled and you know, any boiling that we might need to do, we'll use some in the morning for frying perhaps, but if we're roasting something in a Dutch oven, we'll look to try and get some other hardwoods, some oak, some beech, or even maybe some willow. Okay. Yeah, yeah, all right. Always put the mask back on before you start wandering <laughs> around with a, a live blade. Sure. Essentially, you use the curve, the natural yeah. curve of the ax there, don't yeah. you, to, to hide your fingers? Absolutely. Yeah. A couple of gentle taps. That's it. So I can feel that, that's, that's, yeah, that's in exactly now, yeah. It's sort of stuck to it. 
next door. There we go. So we can split him again. So you were saying now, at that stage, you'd roll that? Yeah, because it's just easier to place the axe sure. on that surface rather than trying to balance it right on that edge on it's the other gonna side. It's going to skid then, isn't yeah. it? It's going to naturally skid. That's the one. So that, I'd naturally want to go on that flat Yeah, you could there, do yeah. the flat. That's nice. Still split that down again. Yeah, you can that one. get one of the flat sides of that. Maybe even come in from the back again, yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah. Nice. But even that, I, I feel comfortable being this distance away from you. Yeah. You know, it's safe for me to be here. So we'll move on to another axe technique, shall we? Yeah. Then, uh... Yeah, let's look at some others. So now I do have a stump, but that doesn't mean to say that the technique we've just looked at isn't valid anymore. It's definitely not an inferior technique that you just leave when you've got a stump. In fact, something that's tall and thin like this is gonna be tricky to balance. Even if you've cut it off square at the ends and your stump's nice and horizontal, it's gonna be tricky to balance. It's a small target, even if you can as well. And that's something to bear in mind because one of my pet hates is seeing people play chicken with their with their own hands they this won't balance properly it will sort of just about balance they're going to hold it with their hand and then they're going to bring the axe and at last minute they're going to move their hand out of the way that type of thing is just an accident waiting to happen at some point you're going to miss you're going to be tired somebody's going to distract you and if you don't believe me just have a look on the internet there's plenty of bushcraft forums on facebook and, and other places where people have got nasty cuts there's pictures of people with nasty cuts on the backs of their hands and it isn't just about flesh wounds there isn't a lot of flesh there you've got nerves and you've got tendons and you've got joints and you do not want to be putting an axe into there it can cause you long-term problems so what we can do is just use the same technique. So rather than trying to balance that on end, we can use exactly the same technique as we've been using already. It doesn't mean just because we've got a stump that we can't use this technique that we've, that we've learned. We place the ax on there, same old story as before, tap it on there. And you can see there again, the ax is embedded, so we're gonna twist the wood. When, what we don't wanna be doing is trying to turn that, because what am I doing? I'm trying to turn the whole stump. That puts a lot of strain on the, the mating of the ax handle and the head, and it will reduce the life of your ax. Maybe give it, give it a, a loose head. So turn the wood. Like so. Another little tip for you, rather than trying to lift the axe and the stump, just give it a little tap before you remove it because it just loosens it enough and again it puts less wear and tear on the axe. You can use that technique when it's valid but there are times when it's not going to be valid and one of them is these pieces of wood, remember, I can get hold of with my hand. That's one of the reasons we selected it. But what if we want to split something bigger? Because we can, because when we've got a stump, we might want to split larger material. We need to change our technique. So for example, this one here. Alrighty, so before I go hell for leather at this, I'm gonna explain a few important points. And all of these things, again, like efficiency, all the safety points add up to being as safe as you can be. Remember, we're not wearing protective clothing. We're not wearing PPE stuff. And we're not wearing hard hats. We're not wearing steel toe caps. We're not wearing protective trousers. We're just wearing our regular outdoor gear. So we wanna do as much as we can to protect ourselves because there's a lot of weight and momentum in even a small axe when you're swinging it and we are going to be more dynamic now. Now I'm working on a stump here which isn't the highest stump in the world. The top of it is about the level of my kneecap there and one of the things with these small forest axes and other half length axes is if I miss something it's on a trajectory towards the top of my shin and maybe even my kneecap. If we're talking in generalities, it depends on how long our arms are, etc. But it's going to hit most people around that area somewhere, whereas a longer axe is going to hit further down and potentially hit the ground first. So if we're working on a low stump, we want to be careful because if I miss what I'm aiming for, I could well then hit myself 
next and one of the things that we want to do whenever we're using an axe is make sure that if what I hit um, what I'm aiming to hit I don't hit you want to make sure that the next thing that the axe goes to is not you what you should also be able to see is you'll notice and this is something I do out of habit now I've put this on the far side of the stump so if I do somehow end up with the axe coming down here there's some stump there to protect me as well. I'm not working right on the edge here, and if I miss, I'm then coming towards myself. The way that I'm gonna adjust my stance to get that vertical strike is just by bending my knees. Yeah, it might look a little silly, but I then get that vertical strike and the ax is not rotating towards myself. Common mistake with axes is overstrike, and this is overstrike. You size it up, you swing the axe with more force, you stretch your arms more, and you miss that way. And you get overstrike damage here in the axe because you go over the top and you hit it there by accident. And it generally bounces off a little bit. But over time, that's going to damage the underside of the, of the handle. So when you're sizing up initially, do think about a realistic distance away when you're swinging it hard. Now, come and have a look at this. I've got a good split there and it's gone quite a long way down but it hasn't quite gone all the way. Now a typical thing that people do is lift that and do this sort of thing. But this axe isn't very heavy, it's just a quite light, lightweight axe, that's why we're carrying it, it's portable. The log is a lot heavier so what we're going to do is lift the whole thing up. And I can lift that quite easily there, there's not a lot of leverage. If I try and lift it from the end of the handle here that's quite difficult. It's a lot of strain on my wrist there. You can probably see my wrist straining and my wrist bending there it was here. Not too much bother at all. So that's just the effect of leverage. So I'm going to lift this onto my shoulder in one uh, smooth motion and I'm going to drop it with the axe inverted so that the weight of the wood hits the blade of the axe like so. And now we get our split. Again, size, sizing things up. And I'm adjusting my stance. So you're not actually, I can see you're not actually doing a huge swing there. No, I, I needed quite a lot of force to start off with because not only have you got a very integral piece of wood that's you know held together you've also got the bark around the outside which is like a little shrug around the outside holding it all together once you've broken it open it's easier to split there's less wood to prise apart you can ease back turn, turn back the throttle as it were the other consideration as well as conservation of energy is every time I go through the wood and hit the stump I'm getting two strikes on my axe blade for every one piece of splitting which is going to mean that you know if I do it every time I'm going to have to sharpen my axe in half the time and um, so I, I don't want to blunt my axe either and again even here we can use that technique but it's more dynamic yeah I wouldn't be happy sitting near to somebody doing this remember before I was sitting really close to Mike when he was doing the hand splitting there weren't bits of wood flying around you don't want to be near somebody that's doing this because you might get hit in the head Now that will just about stand up, but I'm getting to the point where it might be more efficient for me to use the hand technique. Because the accuracy starts to go down, or the need for accuracy goes up, is probably the way to think about it. I can go back to this technique, if I want to split it down further, it's easier. Right, Paul, I'm setting you a challenge. Yeah, what is it? That's a bit of a beast, this one here. What, this one? This thing, this knotty <laughs> bugger there. Yeah, it is, isn't it? I reckon, personally, I would I would not have a go at that with that sized axe. But it, do you it, reckon it could be done? It, it's a challenge, for sure. It does a, it's the knots. It's, to, to me, Mike, it's the knots in it yeah. rather than the, the overall size of it. It's a gnarly piece it of wood. It is gnarly. We'll see. We'll have a go. Yeah? <laughs> let's do it. Right, let's see. It's definitely not going to split in one go, <laughs> I can tell you that much.
That's sheer solid. Well and truly There is a split. There's a bit of a split, but there's not enough of a split. It's very dense. And the challenge now is getting, <laughs> is getting the axe out of it. That's the problem. But luckily we've got another axe, because yeah. we've got the one that you were using <laughs> as well. It's an opportunity to have a look at another technique. Let's move to a different technique. Why not? We'll take yeah. the opportunity. And this wasn't contrived. We didn't no, kind no. of go, oh, let's do this. And no, then no. we can, Mike, Mike and I didn't discuss this ahead of time. It was like, okay, we'll give it a go. Just try it. It didn't work. It was just sat there asking for yeah, it. Yeah, it was, it? wasn't it? <laughs> in case you know there is a split starting there the axe has caused the split to run to about there but it's not really running any further but we can try and encourage that in different ways but I want to see where the splits going also I need to be able to get my axe out and it's it's pretty well embedded in there at the moment it's one of my favorite axes <laughs> so what I've got here it's one of our woodcraft areas it's one of the areas that we teach these skills I've got some old wooden wedges. A technical term for these, it's an old English word, is a glut. I don't know the etymology of it, I don't know where it comes from, but we often refer to the, the wooden wedges as gluts and the metal wedges as wedges, so um, we can differentiate between the two. Not getting away from the challenge. Don't let it win. No, yeah. it's not. You asked me to split it, I'm <laughs> going to split it. Think about where the axe is going next. I've got the, the stump here I'm working on, I'm not working right on the edge of the stump, so if I slip it's coming towards me. I'm working in the middle or even a little bit further away. And then also the follow through there is past my body. It's not here. You want to be out of the way so that follow through is uh, not towards you. The other thing you might notice that I'm doing is when I'm working with the axe, I'm moving the piece of wood to get the angle that I want and the axe is going pretty much vertically. In case you're interested, these are made of holly, uh, Ilex aquifolium if you want the Latin name. We use holly for this because it's available, there's a fair amount of it nearby. It's quite a waxy wood, it has some uh, lubrication if you like, but also importantly it's a hard wood. It's a hard, hard wood and you want a tough wood so holly, hornbeam, those type of woods that are really tough make really good um, and long-lasting uh, gluts. Here we are with the beast log and I'm going to blame Mike for this, <laughs> the beast log. Um, now I'm going to actually knock this axe in a bit further because I, I've got a semblance of a split but it doesn't really run and I can't get the wedges in. I might get one in there, but I'm gonna see if I can knock the ax in a bit more and get the ax uh, to create more of a split. Do have two axes here. I brought one along for, for Mike to use as well. I'm gonna utilize that. I'm gonna look at the line of that crack and I'm gonna place the ax there. I'm gonna leave space there because what I wanna do is try and extend that crack open and get a wedge in, which will then free the ax. I don't wanna to get too stuck in there. I'm beating it though, Mike. Yeah, we're getting there. Now, I can get that in there. So I've got this crack here now that's opened up and there. So the original ax has created a crack up there, but I've got this other one here. So I'm gonna put it, I'm gonna put it in here to free this ax up, I think. So that's that ax free. So let's see if we can get the other one free as well. And there we go, got my my best axe out, which I'm happy about. <laughs> oh, job done. There you go. Challenge complete. Challenge complete. I could, of course, made these. It's just we had some old ones lying around, but these are quite quick and easy to make. If you've only got one axe, though, make them first <laughs> before you get the axe stuck. So, too big to hold in our hands, and now we're going to look at the scenario of not having a stump. So we're out in the woods, this is too big to split. 
why might we want to do that? Well, it might be colder months of the year. We might want to feed a stove. We might fell some dead standing. We want to split this down so it'll go into a stove. So we're going to put the log down on the ground and we're going to attack it horizontally. And it's really important that we get our heels no further back than the front face that we're hitting. Because if I'm standing here and I'm trying to split this and it runs off, it could bounce off towards my leg, it could bounce off towards my ankle. The further back I am, the more in danger I am. This would be ludicrous to try and split this here, in my opinion, and have your feet there. What you really want to be doing is moving your heels here so that there is that line there. Heel is there, the front face is there, and I've got that no further back than that. Then if I miss, the axe has got follow through that isn't me. So I'm going to bring my feet in front and then I'm going to size things up to make sure my hands are not slippery and I'm going to aim to hit the top half of that front face there. I don't want to try and embed the axe in the middle, I want to clip it going through that top half. It's going to be a short, sharp, speedy attack on this. If you do it too slow, you just slowly push the log back and you're not going to split it, so you need to be fast with it. Like so. I was a little bit off with that one. See if I can get my accuracy better. That was a good one. It works really well on snow in the winter because you're not getting that downward impact into soft snow. You've got horizontal impact. So I use it quite a lot for winter camping. I've sawn the pieces to length for the stove and then I'm splitting them down quite rapidly to go into the tent. Speaking of winter camping, I might have a larger axe. This is the Scandinavian forest axe. More generally, it's what we would call three quarter length axe, three quarters of the length from my fingertips to my sternum. It's got a heavier head. It's still a general, uh, general purpose profile, very similar to the small forest axe, just bigger. Um, now, gentlemen will appreciate this. If you're, if you're swinging this at full length, you're probably gonna clip the ground. So your tendency or your first idea might be to hold it shorter <laughs> but the problem is as the axe head goes that way the handle yeah. comes the other way and you might clip somewhere you don't want to clip with the with the hell think about the the hands of a clock so that's six o'clock we're going to go around as I go around towards nine o'clock gets a lot further away from the ground so I can modify the distance that the axe is away from the ground simply by moving it around that circumference. So I'm going to work to the side of myself rather than working between the legs and that gives me the clearance that I need and it's not encumbered by my groin, I'm not going to hit myself with any part of the axe. Before, I'm going to put something a little bit underneath it just to prop the front up. Now, what I don't want to be doing is trying to hit that there with my legs here. That would be stupid. Yep. Mask in the pocket. Now I'm just going to make sure that Mike's not in the way. He's pretty close. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty yeah, close. Pretty yeah. close. Now, if you've ever ridden a mountain bike down a trail, if you think about a rock in the middle of the trail, you tend to hit it. It's the same with motocross. It's, if you think about the obstacle, you're going to go towards it. So what I need you to think about doing this technique is to think about the front that you want to hit. Do not think about your feet. Once you've sized it all up, ready to go. And it just took off a little bit because of the size and weight of it. I'll attack it again. This is fairly normal. It's a big piece of wood. 
Okay, I've got a good crack across the front now. So you often learn more. If this is a textbook split, cleave open, you'd go, wow, that's fantastic. But what if you end up with this problem? Well, you can see there's a good crack across the front. It just hasn't traveled all the way to the back yet. It's gone so far down. There may be a knot in there we can't see. It's also a larger diameter piece of wood. So we'll attack it from the other end. We'll carefully remove the ax. We don't want our fingers anywhere near. Very efficient lever here. That's the plane of the crack. So I'm going to attack it in that same plane. Get my feet in position, size it up again, and there we go. Okay, so we've talked a fair bit about axe safety and, and do concentrate on those points. We can, of course, put the mask back on an axe to keep it safe, but it's not going to protect us from everything. You know, you can still fall on that. It will go through the mask. So you do need to be careful with an axe, um, even when it's in the mask. It's more to protect your equipment from the sharp edge as much as anything. Um, but a couple of extra tips for being safe with axes around camp and when you're carrying axes. Um, with, a, with an axe like this, I just tend to hold it like this. I tend to strangle it. I tend to carry it around like so. Another way of carrying an axe with a slightly longer helve is, is like that. It rests in the crook and you can walk around like that and it's quite, it's quite uh, safe and it's quite comfortable to carry. Another way if you need your hands free is, <laughs> is just in the back of your belt there. So I might want to carry a load of firewood or something over back to camp and I want that hands free. I wouldn't hike with that there, but it's just somewhere where I can put it where I work with my hands. But you do need to be careful if you're on a steep slope where you might slip over, I wouldn't have that there because you're going to fill it one of your, your buttocks basically. So there's a couple of methods there of carrying it, particularly over short distances. But what about leaving the axe around camp for short periods of time? Putting the mask on and off sometimes can be a bit of a, a waste of time. It can be a bit of a pain. So let's have a look. We'll go over to the stump. Now in my mind, that is not safe because you've got some edge that is uh, exposed. So if you put the ax into a stump, just make sure the whole cutting edge is embedded and not exposed. It can be quite hard to get it into the end of the grain sometimes. What can be quicker and easier is just going into the side of the grain because that's the way the grains aligned. So again, that can be quite a quick place to, if you just wanted to tidy things away or move some stuff before carrying on, that's often a very good place to put the axe in the side there. And finally, if there's no stump, remember we've looked at some no stump cutting techniques, maybe find somewhere that is a little safer to lean it, like at the base of a tree somewhere. So that sort of thing would be a bit safer than just leaning it up against the tree because the blade's actually not somewhere where somebody's likely to kick it. And that's what we're gonna do in camp. And speaking of camp, Mike, we should probably yeah start thinking about getting the rest of camp set up. We've split some wood and we've got bits and pieces that we need. We've got plenty of kindling. We can split some more out efficiently if we need to. Um, I think we should probably get a tarp up in case that rain comes back. Sure. Um, maybe have a look at lighting a fire, getting a brew on, yeah. etc., and making ourselves uh, comfy uh, for the night. Good stuff. Let's do it.
Well, we've got the rope nicely tensioned and we've got the big DD tarp. Uh, no connection with the company, by the way, just so that's clear. It's a square cut tarp, so it's rectangular and we really want the guy lines coming away from the corner so that you get an even pull across the sheet. So these tape loops are a good indicator because they're bisecting that angle nicely. What we don't want to do is tie it off there because it'll be super tight there and it's going to be slack there. And equally, if we tie it off that way, nice and taut that in that direction, but it'll be slack here and we'll have trouble with water pooling. So we want to try and pull away at that angle, 45 degrees, if you like, in the middle of there. So we want to try and find something we can tie off. I reckon that's all right there, Mike. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now I'm not going to pull that super tight because it's not attached to the the line, the main uh, ridge line. But I am going to put a an adjustable guy line hitch in here just just now. And this is what I use on small tarps as well. Um, if you're using super slippery string, you can do three wraps first, but I normally just do two, and then the third one goes around and we put a bite through, and that's your adjustable guy line hitch, which a lot of people know. We've got that one set there. Another tip with a big tarp in particular is to not try and get all the corners at exactly the same height, because then you've got to get so much tension into the sheet that it can be hard not to get pooling, even as hard as you try to get it tight. And what you don't want to what what you don't want to do is go away, come back, having had rain and your tarp be full of water in the big pool and it will stretch it. I've seen that happen sometimes. So the key is really to try and get one corner higher than the other on each side. Just a little pointer. Um, you'll see that nice slope there, I think, now. So we've got this end high, which is great, because this is the area we're going to be going in and out of most. The back end is low, so if we do have a lot of rain, we've had some heavy showers today, it's going to run across the sheet and it's going to drop off that back corner. It's not going to pool in here with us trying to keep it horizontal. But clearly, if we put the back corners both low, the back of the shelter would be narrower than the front of the shelter. Uh, and so I've done it that way on this side and I've done it that way on the other side. I think we can get settled in now. We can get some other kit in here. Think about getting a pot hanger sorted and get the kettle on. I think we deserve a brew. We do deserve a brew, yeah. So we've got the main tarp set up over the kind of camp area where we're going to sleep tonight. We're not going to do our shelters just yet. We'll come on to that in a minute. Paul's got some more tips for you guys, hope you're ready. Paul's got some more tips for you guys on feather sticks this time. But I think it's one of those beginner skills that all bushcrafters should learn uh, and just get the fundamentals right in the first place. And Paul's got some, uh, hopefully got some tips to tell you guys. So this is some of the split wood that we collected earlier dead standing. That's always a good place to start with firewood, dead standing and dry. Because remember, some wood, it's dead, but it's only just gone dead. It's only just become not alive. That doesn't mean it's immediately bone dry. So we want dry, standing, dead wood. Make feather sticks with this. And we're also gonna make a hearth board. We're gonna do our whole fire lay with split wood. What I'm looking for is a straight grain, not free, and with a, with a pretty even grain as well. So even little ripples like this in the grain here, if you can see that, um, can be problematic. Ideally, you want something that is really nice and straight with no issues in. If there are any knots, maybe they're at one end and that's not gonna be a problem because you're gonna need to hold the wood while you make the shaving. The other thing though is, we're focusing on the center of the wood here, the back of the wood. Even really vertical wood can be quite damp on the first few millimeters in, particularly if the bark is rotting away, it can hold moisture. So damp rotting bark is never going to help with your fire lighting. There's no circumstance that anybody can tell me about where damp rotting bark and fibers from the inner bark and the first layers of wood that might be slightly punky. You can see the different coloration here 
where that wood starting to rot away and it's a bit damp on the outside what we want to do is get rid of that that's the first thing to do um, with our feather stick so we can just do that with our knife we can just shave away just roughly it doesn't need to be a, a great carving project just quickly get rid of that wet stuff first maybe a few millimeters eighth of an inch on the outside perhaps and we're, we're into the dry stuff as long as it was vertical in the first place initially I am not trying to create lots of nice curls I just want to create a flat surface to operate on so that might just mean planing away might mean removing quite a lot of material if it's if it's split quite ragged, raggedy if that's even a word raggedly I think is probably the word my brain was looking for there I get this flat surface okay keep my hands at the top and then I'm going to start sliding down and creating curls now if you're a beginner at this the thing I would recommend most of us are using some sort of bushcraft knife as they tend to be called these days a fixed bladed belt knife with a flat bevel what a lot of people call a scandy grind it's a fine flat bevel and then we're going to just run that down and increase the angle slightly towards the wood until we start catching it and then just run it down to the bottom and we'll remove some of the bumps doing that we'll increase the angle slightly more so what I'm doing is just increasing the angle that way gradually until I start getting some bite into the wood so I'm starting the same place at the top each time and I run all the way down even if it falls off I keep going all the way to the bottom and I stop at the same place again and if I run out of room I just push the curls away a little bit to give myself a bit more room what I don't want to do is kind of lose a bit and go back to the start lose a bit go back to the start lose a bit go back to the start because I'll end up with a big gouge here and it'll get lumpy and bumpy like a washboarded road and I will get more and more frustrated with trying to get curls off that so always start and finish at the same place start at the top work down and you can see as I broaden the face these curls are getting wider but it's actually becoming harder for me to maintain the angle but what I get as a result is I get an edge I get a ridge so one of the other things we want to look at is working the ridges you can see that's a finer feather stick okay it came off doesn't matter don't get stressed about that and if you're new to this don't get stressed if 90% of your curls fall off it's about learning the skill it's about practicing and getting a feel for it so I've got curls there already maybe I'll work this one here and here's a little thing if you put the tip up curls go towards the tip so I can direct them it's a bit raggy in that grain there you can see it's it's rotten around there and that transition between the really solid wood in the middle across there and it being open grained is making it quite jumpy it's good practice for some pine species using sweet chestnut but it's not the easiest wood to use uh, willow is easier if you're in North America eastern white cedar or western red cedar work really well for feather sticks you know how well those would split anyway nice and fine grained if I drop the tip the curls go away from the tip I'm getting some okay curls there anyway there because that's still quite fat your ideal feather stick is thin enough here that once this is all ablaze that that stick that's left here will light from that that becomes part of your next level of fuel we've managed to keep some curls on <laughs> Mike's done some really nice scraggly thin things oh, frilly, lacy <laughs> we've got some chunkers that I've managed to do and I think between us we've got a fire there Mike an old one this but they do last just worth checking it all fits together properly though so we can uh, get the fire going I think
So we've had fires here before, it's a camp that we use from time to time. So I've scraped back the leaf litter from the area that's, that's fallen in here. This is quite damp even though there's charcoal in here. I'm still going to put down a base for my fire. And it doesn't have to be beautiful but it needs to do several things. One is um, it needs to provide some insulation from the ground. Uh, both in terms of dampness and in colder months of the year. Also temperature, the temperature difference between the wood and the ground is going to be sufficient to make a marginal difference to your fire lighting uh, success. Uh, if it was really wet we could even do a double lay uh, just like you can with, with other sticks. Notice I'm laying it with the, the nice dry material upwards because it's fuel then at the heart of your fire. The other thing it does is let oxygen up into the fire so you've got like a, a series of channels that allows some air to get in so you've got fuel oxygen and you're helping uh, with the warmth as well so all those elements of the fire triangle heat fuel and oxygen that you're considering those even just with the baseboard of the fire so we've just got our feather sticks and we've been careful to keep these up off the ground once you shave this material you've got some bits are sort of paper thin and they do act like a bit of a sponge. If you put a piece of very thin dry wood on your tongue it very quickly wicks up the material, the, the moisture rather, on your on your tongue. Um, it's one way with frozen wood in the winter you can tell that it's actually dry rather than just full of moisture and frozen. You can tell that difference in, in frozen conditions that you can feel that it's dry. So it will wick moisture so we don't want to be putting these down on the ground. The way that we create a fire lay with these and the reason we've got the curls just around, get that one out of the way, the reason we've got the curls just around one side rather than around the whole thing is that we lay this down with all the curls in the middle of the fire lay. Now if it were a windy day I'd take uh, some considerable thought about which way I would angle this and I'd want to have my back to the wind and I'd want to have this open V lay facing me so that there is some oxygen taking for initial flames into the rest of the uh, into the rest of the curls. Today it's not windy doesn't really matter nice decent sized matches with long sticks on and my hands aren't cold today, but I'm in the habit of always striking a match by pushing it down. This is something I used to work with Ray Mears years ago. He's mentioned on his TV shows a lot um, that the, the strength of a match is in uh, the shaft in pushing it down. We can all take a match and easily break it there, which can happen if you've got lack of manual dexterity. And then you're left with dealing with something that's small and short. But it's very, very difficult to break a match by squeezing down from the end. So if you're pushing it down, however little dexterity you've got, that's just a habit to get into. Just do it all the time. And then when it comes to really matter, you're just in the habit of doing it and you're not gonna do something different. Don't just go, light the match, trying to light the stuff. Light the match and let it become established and then take it to what you're lighting. Match sticks light. I'm, I'm cupping it to protect it. It's just a habit. Now I take it down to the base of my feathers. And I don't just light it in one place, I light it in multiple places. If I can. There we go. Matches away. Don't just chuck them on the floor. People get excited. Put your fire lighting equipment back where it should be. Have a place for everything. Put it back in its place. And now if I need to, I can manipulate these things. I can move things around. I can get more oxygen in there if I need to do that. But don't faff around with it. People faff around with fires too much and put them out initially. Now I can use that initial flame to get my splints going. Shimmy that across without killing it. like with all of our fire lighting what we want to do is go up through the gears so you start in first gear as it were with the finest material then we add second gear third gear and so on if you and we have a sustained fire and that's got a nice amount of heat there I'm gonna move away slightly it's getting hot now and um, looks like a little capsule in re-entry 
That's going to get our water boiled pretty quickly there, Mike. Morning guys, it is another day here in the woods. I actually had a good sleep. I'm not, I don't usually sleep too well in the hammock. I find it tends to make my back ache a bit, but I had the tarp up. There was no rain, it was a lovely still night. I actually saw three roe deer. As soon as I woke up in the morning and looked out to the right of my hammock, I saw three roe deer just run across uh, the back of the woods there, which was really nice to see. Paul, is, he was set up just over there. He's a ground dwelling. I, I would have done some ground dwelling, but I do it all the time. So it's quite nice to get the hammock out. And actually for the bugs, because it's got the bug net on, it just helped a bit, uh, given that it's summer, although it's cooler temperatures, the bugs are still around. So, uh, so yeah, so that was the sleeping setup last night. I didn't do too much filming, because really this video is sort of not about the overnighting, it's more about the, the bushcraft tips and getting those tips across to you. So we've got the fire going, we're gonna put on some uh, breakfast, maybe have a tea or a coffee, and then we're gonna get straight back into some more tips for you guys. How much coffee do you want, Mike? Plenty. Plenty, right. Yeah. We'll, we'll go for the whole hog okay. then. Okay. I'll put some more water on for. That's a lot of coffee. coffee. <laughs> we'll take some out for porridge, yeah. then we can use the rest for eggs. So that, that's our second round. Round two, yeah. Round two, we'll get that one straight back on. This just needs to sit for a few minutes and then we'll do the, do the drop. One thing Mike and I were talking about just now off camera but we thought it'd be worth mentioning was this maintaining this V fire lay so we had this V shape when we lit the fire particularly yesterday when we did it with feather sticks but the thing is that you get crossed over you get most flame there and you get this column of heat coming up and with something like these billy cans getting that column of heat coming up directly below is going to give you a fast boil I threw the oak on that we had last night um, to catch from the smaller stuff that we lit this morning and that's giving us a good background heat but I'm still maintaining that crossover of small slit sweet chestnut in this case but it could be anything that you've split crossing it over and getting that flame directly under the billy so we can boil as fast as, as we can. So Paul, Paul says he's got a, a technique to show me called the coffee, the coffee, coffee drop, the yeah. coffee drop. So <laughs> I've never heard of this before. I have actually seen Paul do it, but I have no idea. I've never asked him what, what on earth he's doing. So prepare to be amazed by something here. What, what is the coffee drop? Very simply, it's a method of getting the grounds to go to the bottom. So you've okay. got your coffee, you've poured your hot water in. It's all mixed in together. It's, yeah. it's it's brewing, but then you want the grounds at the bottom of the pot. Okay. Yeah, we're not. We haven't got a filter. We haven't got filter papers. We haven't. Yeah. Yes, and you can maybe pour it through a bandana and stuff. But sure, it's all yeah. messy. So this is a really simple method. Origin story, very quickly. Yeah. Is that I was um, on a ski tour in Norway. We're doing this ski tour in the mountains, and all day we had these Norwegians behind us. Every time we stopped, we could see this group of Norwegians behind us and heading to the same hut that we yeah. were going to. Clearly about. 
25 kilometers into the mountains. But we were like, why are they not catching us up? We're Brits, yeah. you know, and we're okay at skiing, but these are Norwegians. They yeah, should yeah. be catching us up and take, overtaking us. Anyway, we got to the hut first. They got in the hut um, a bit after us. And the reason they had so much, well, the reason they were so slow is because they had beers and steaks and, you know, we had our dehydrated, you know, rations and things. We were sure. out for five or six days. They were out for, they were just going to the hut for the weekend and then right. skiing out. Yeah. Yeah. So having a bit of a boys weekend, yeah. just old school friends. The next morning, one of the guys was in the kitchen looking like he was doing some sort of weight training exercise yeah. with a kettle in the corner of the kitchen. And I'd say, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I'm, I'm dropping the coffee. Um, but he was doing it in the kettle because that's sure. all that was in the hut. But it works super, super well in the billy. And we've... You know, I sort of started experimenting with it in different pots when I got back, and it works really well right. in, in the billies because they're, they're quite tall. Sure, it doesn't yeah. work quite so well in broad, in flat, yeah. you know, like Coleman tins and yes, Tonka yeah, yeah. and things, but these billies okay. or a Moore's pot works yeah. really well. So I'll show, you the, I'll show you the method and then you can have a go. Okay. Yeah? So we've got, we've got our coffee in there. Yeah. You'd let that settle for a few minutes. Well, we? I've let it brew. I don't really Just, mind about it settling. Yeah. I actually give it a bit of a slosh to start off with because all the Get stuff the is stuck on the side. Yeah. You want it moving. You don't want it just stuck on the side. Okay. And then you can kind of joke and say you have to get into like a proper lunge, lunge. position thing. Sure. But, but basically what you want to be doing is be, be able to straighten the arm. So here. And it's a bit of a lock of the elbow at the bottom. Right. Not a slosh because that's yeah. going to slosh the grounds around. Yeah. It's just like. So. Yeah, and lift it, pull it back as far like a row, like an upright like row. That's it. Yeah. A bit faster than the drop. Yeah, that's good. That's nice. Natural. <laughs> it's that like, it's that like coffee drinker in me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a bit. That's a bit, of a, that was a bit of a slosh. slosh. That was yeah. a bit of a slosh. But yeah. I actually felt the liquid then. Uh, yeah. Let's take a look. Look at that. Oh, big difference! Wow, I'm shocked actually. That's a huge difference. Yeah, all those grounds that were floating yeah. on the top. Crikey. All gone. That's some, I'm impressed with that. I did not think that would uh, kind of push those grounds yeah. down that far. Yeah. That's and impressive. And then when we're pouring, if there's if there's more than one of you, I mean if there's yeah. just one of you, you can drink it straight out of the pot. You don't need to pour it. <laughs> yeah. But if there's more than one of you, yeah. the, just the next tip is when you pour it, is don't kind of slosh it back for each cup. Right, okay. Just lined, line them up and then just pour, Keep pour, going. pour. Sure. Yeah, and then you're not sloshing the grounds around at the bottom. But shall we have a cup? Let's do it. Yeah, definitely. Do you want me to fill that bottle up, Mike? Just yeah. I mean, well, <laughs> just, uh, here you go. Of coffee. <laughs> yeah, that's, of that'll coffee. do probably. Yeah. Pints of coffee. <laughs> that's that's just this morning's coffee. Yeah. The verdict. It's good. <laughs> yeah. 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 No bits. No grounds. Mike good. passed the test. <laughs> hey. <laughs> So after probably a litre and a half nearly of coffee, I'm, I'm, stoked. I'm feeling buzzing, yeah, I'm buzzed <laughs> up. I'm ready to do a hand drill. Now I have got an ember from a hand drill once before. I haven't, not on YouTube, once before I had a go and I'm not gonna lie, my, my hands absolutely blistered up. They're nice and pappy now because <laughs> I haven't done one in a while. So I guess what I'm saying, Paul, is can you teach me and my subscribers some basic tips yeah. on primitive fire the woods that you can use, certainly more about the technique because I'd say mine was probably out. Yeah. And just basic tips to help us get a fire going sure. by friction. Absolutely. But I think one of the things that's worth saying is with the drill, um, this isn't something that you, for the best drills at least, you go out and grab now to make a fire now. Um, these drills have been cut green and I've got a selection here. They've been cut green um, from the bush and they have then been stripped of bark and they've been straightened uh, using heat of a fire. So you already need a fire to make really good drills. This is a piece of equipment. It's a very simple, mechanically, it's a very simple piece of equipment, but then you carry it with you. Um, and I would contrast that with, say, the bow drill, which is very widely applicable. The range of materials you can use for bow drill is very wide. You have a high level of mechanical advantage. It's a realistic technique as long as you've practiced before, even if you're a bit out of condition because you don't need to maintain your hands in good condition. So Mike mentioned the pappy hands <laughs> yeah. and having made them sore in the past um, hand drilling. That's one of the things with hand drill is that you need some specific physical conditioning of the hands. 
I'm not saying you can't go out and find some dead plant stems, so sometimes you can find burdock stems, sometimes you can find ragwort stems, sometimes you can find uh, mullein stems that you can use pretty much straight away but they're not the most uh, resilient of hand drills and the best ones tend to be cut green and then carry with you. Here I'm using elder, this is a Sambucus nigra, so it's European. I'm not going to get into the complexities of plugging other materials into the bottom of stems. You can use hazel in this environment if you get a nice straight piece of hazel and make a drill in a similar way, but it's harder than elder. Um, you, your technique needs to be somewhat better. I think you just need a bit more brute strength, frankly, and you need your hands to be in, in good condition. Elder is probably the best and most accessible, very good quality hand drill that you can make in, in the north, if you like, in northern Europe, Britain, and also, you know, parts of North America when you're into the north of the United States and into Canada. Again, I'd be looking at Elder. We have here a range of different hearth materials. You can of course carry a, a hearth with you if you want, particularly if you're carrying a day pack or a, or a backpack, because you can get a lot of fires out of them. You can see this small hearth board, it's not very heavy, there's a lot of fires being made with. This is Clematis, uh, Clematis vitalba. It's a wild vine that grows on uh, quite calcific soil, so chalky ground, so you get it heavily in the South Downs, for example. You get it around Dover and around the South Coast. Probably more widespread and more available up and down the UK, but also more widely is Ivy, uh, Hedera helix. And this is quite a thick stem. You can see there's still the outer bark there. It's um, seasoned in place, and I think it's worth mentioning this, because if you cut green Ivy and take it home, <laughs> and put it in your garage or your shed to, to season, it tends to go like concrete, it's super hard. So that's not the way to get a good hearth board. What you want to be doing is looking for, say, a birch tree, I, I saw one the other day, just an example, birch tree that had blown over and it had ivy growing up it and that ivy had snapped when the tree had blown over and then that had been laying horizontally and it had started to season really quite nicely. This one is something, again, common and widespread. This is a piece of willow. Um, we've got, I think, 18 species uh, of willow native in the UK, if I remember rightly. Some of them are quite small, but you're going to find goat willow, grey willow, um, white willow, widespread, not just in the UK, all over Western Europe, into Scandinavia. You just don't want it too hard. If you've used willow for bow drill at all, you'll know that sometimes it can be a bit on the hard side and it can, even with a lot of pressure on the drill, it can still polish. So you, you want to make sure it's not so hard that you can't drill into it. You definitely want to do that fingernail test to make sure that you can relatively easily make an impression with your fingernail. If you can't, without really bending your fingernail, it's probably too hard. Um, but that's a piece of willow that um, I've used successfully. It works nicely. For our North American brethren, um, couple of options here as well as the as well as the uh, the willows um, we have uh, West that's Western Red Cedar that one and again uh, good but need a little bit more conditioning on your hands perhaps than some of the vines but in the West that's a good one to use a bit further east we've got Eastern White Cedar that's just a branch and that again works well American elder on, on uh, eastern white cedar is one I've used in Ontario, Canada to good success. Um, easy to find, easy to make, and a uh, very good friction fire lighting wood. That's just another bit of clematis. Um, more generally, um, spruce can work quite well. So things like Norway spruce, um, black spruce, um, again, on the, on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, even you could have a go with uh, Scots pine. So you could have a go with Scots pine over here. Um, right through Eurasia. In terms of tinder, in terms of your bird's nest bundle, this needs breaking up a little bit more. Hand drill embers are really quite small. You know, with a bow drill ember, you've got a, a, a bigger diameter drill, you've got a larger hearth, you've got a larger notch as a result of that. If you're cutting an eighth of that circle for your notch, for the dust to go into, it's, a, it's an eighth of something bigger. You're gonna get more dust in there, you're gonna get a bigger ember. Hand drill embers tend to be a bit smaller, so your tinder needs to be really top notch otherwise you might lose that once you put it into the into the tinder bundle we're in a sweet chestnut wood so this is the inner bark of sweet chestnut it's taken um, from 
bark that's starting to rot away from the trunk and we can scrape it out with our fingernails. Just making a little ember pan here, something we can catch the dust on. I've got a couple of, of existing holes in this here, um, but I'm going to start a new a new uh, depression so you can see the process from the start. Also, as the holes get deeper, you get more sidewall friction. It's the same with bow drill. As you drill deeper into the hearthboard, you get less of less proportion of the friction just on the bottom and you start getting more friction around the side. I'm just rotating and creating a depression and I'm moving my hand around so that I'm getting the best angles. And I just want to be able to seat the bottom of the drill initially and then we will burn it in very quickly it won't take much and unlike bow drill bow drill you really just you put a shallow point on the bottom of the drill and then you just seat that shallow point here I'm trying to accommodate the whole diameter of the drill um, partly because it's an elder drill an elder has pith in the middle of it and so you can't put a shallow point on the bottom of it but even so even if I was using something that had uh, more uh, integrity in the middle than Elder has, I would still be doing this just shallow depression. Somewhere flat to sit that. Now some people will put their feet on this end of the, of the hearth board and hold it there. Personally, and a lot of people agree with me, particularly as you get a little bit older, I'm a, just, a, just a touch older than Mike, <laughs> um, put the foot there because then it's easier to to, to bend over that than it is with your foot further out. You just, you've got a little bit more natural flexibility there. A little bit of smoke. That's all I need at this stage because I'm just looking to seat the set together. I've got a nice circular depression that meets the, the bottom of that and now I'm going to cut my notch because you can see all this powder is going everywhere. And that's why you cut a notch in any of this type of friction fire lighting, whether it's a, a hand drill or a bow drill, where you're twisting a piece of wood into another piece of wood. If you don't create somewhere for the dust to go, it just goes everywhere and you're never going to get an ember. Start by just making a center line. I like to do that for reference. And then I'll make an angle either side of it, like so. Then I bring those lines down the front, like so. And then I'm just going to chip that out with the knife. So I need something underneath. And you can put your knife underneath, but it might leave a bit of a mark on it. Um, certainly uh, hunter-gatherers that I've spent time with often just put their knife underneath. Um, I'm going to take that little board that I made and put that underneath. Another little detail is I've cut the notch on the side that I can see. It, there's nothing to stop it working if the notch is on the other side, but it's harder for me to see what's going on. If I can see into it here, then I can see how much dust is accumulating, whether or not there's an ember. Same with bow drill. Cut the notch on the side that you can see. All right, so I start off steadily at the top, just warm the setup. How much downward pressure are you putting A on? reasonable amount, particularly towards the end of the, the descent. Start off quite fast, yeah. slow down a bit and then put a bit more pressure on. Give it a good grind. And there's an ember. When you start to see smoke coming out the bottom of the pile of dust, that's typically a good indication that you've got an ember. Carefully tip it away. It's a big one. <laughs> there we go. It's 
So it's a really elegant method of creating an ember. I really like it. But you do need some practice. You need some hand conditioning. <laughs> and generally for the best drills, you need to prepare them ahead of time. It's a piece of your bushcraft kit. Good fire lighting, easy fire lighting, is down to getting everything prepared. Sure. I always, I always work on the basis that I'm going to get a fire if I want a fire. Yeah. But all the corners that I cut, I'm reducing my chances. Yeah. And um, not cutting corners is down to preparation. Yeah. And then put your, yeah. And then, yeah. It's, then it's nice and solid there. I feel central. Yeah. And you're asking about pressure. Some of yeah. it comes from triceps. Yeah. But also, if you if you use your core a bit, particularly yeah. at the bottom. You, yeah, so okay. it's just it's just a bit of a crunch, yep. which is why I like getting the foot in that position because you can crunch over it a bit better than if your sure. foot's out wider. Unless Hopefully you're... the guys can see that. Yeah, you're looking. Well, we'll see. We'll soon tell. We've got to burn it in first, haven't we? So. Yeah, we can always bring the camera in and just make sure that's yeah, that's good. Yeah, start off steady. Yeah, that's good. So one little tip for you at this stage, Mike. Yeah. Um, you're, you're doing your hands very sort of flat. Okay. If you, if you the, the main part that you use really is here. On the, so if you open your hand very slightly, so you're not rubbing the top parts of your hands. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Maybe that's why I've been getting blisters all that time. <laughs> Two points there, I yeah. think the squeaking is because it's starting to polish a little bit, so just try and get a little bit more pressure. More pressure, yeah. Um, and that, so just a little bit more downward pressure. Yeah. But what you want to try and avoid is pushing your hands together too hard because okay. that increases the chances of blister. So you've got to sure. kind of tell your brain, yeah, it's tempting push, to, to push down, not okay. in. Yeah. Oh. And then the other thing is as you're getting towards the bottom, yeah the angle is starting to come out a bit because you're, you're oh, kind okay. of pushing so you need to kind of let your elbows come in a bit and let the let the push come from the okay. from the core again just start steady so we're going to change the camera angle guys we're going to bring it over here so you can see it all a bit close up because all you're going to see from that angle is just my hands really so we're going to hopefully bring yeah. the camera around so if you do the first descent and then i, I can yep. bring the camera around for you Sounding good. That's a good grind, Mike. You're not getting any squeaking. Will this auto focus? Yeah, tap it. I feel like I'm losing, losing strength losing. in my arms. Oh, okay. Well, should we do some? Should we do some alternating? Yeah. <laughs> it's that downward pressure you start to. Okay. Yeah. Once you get it smoking, it it stays smoking. Yeah. That's thick smoke there. Yeah. See it, and we're glowing, but do we need to build it up? Is there one in there? Yeah, it's glowing. Okay, that's good. We've got one then. Hey, now now's the harder bit, really, getting into into a flame. 
How's that feel getting an ember, Mike? Yeah, good. Really good. I mean, it, it's, it's definitely down to technique because it's, it's your body position, isn't it? Sat over yeah. there. I think I was so far out here that I, my arms actually were straining here. That's mm -hmm. where it felt like the strain was. As soon as I moved in, kept it all a bit more central, you could, you could almost instantly feel the weights off your arms and it becomes more on your body. Yeah. That made a massive difference from cool. yeah and then once being you out there. once we got it once i did a descent and we got it smoking yeah, yeah you could then keep it smoking yeah yeah right let's get that off the deck let's remove that stick that plate rather there we go i'm going to squeeze that in all right that's good keep it squeezed in Keep going. Smoke's thickening and we have flame. Hey! Yay. First Excellent. hand drill without ruining my hands. That was a, a much better technique. Much better. And that was Elder. Elder on onto Clematis. Clematis. Yeah. That is brilliant. Thank you, Paul. I've enjoyed that. Hopefully you guys have learned some tips from that as well because it's, it's certainly not something I think you can just pick up straight away. You know, the technique itself. Like I say, the first time I ever did it was just brute force. And that's why I had such blistered hands. But I can see, you know, even your tips such as I was keeping my hands together like this and there was so much friction it was creating mm. that that's probably why I got so many blisters. Paul was just saying, if you tilt your hands out slightly, almost like a V, right? So you're using that part of your palm. That made a, that made a huge difference as well. So it's mm. a combination of that and then bringing it all a bit in closer to my body. That's what sort of, I think, helped improve the technique. So I hope you've enjoyed that episode. I've certainly le learned a few tips. I appreciate it might have been a fairly long video. I wanted this video to be informative. I wanted, wanted it to be packed full of tips. Paul, it's been brilliant. Thanks so much. My pleasure, Mike. It's, My been, pleasure. it's been a learning curve for me, especially something you know as, as tricky as the hand drill. It's certainly not an easy easy skill to pick up. No. Paul, you do a blog, don't you? Yeah, it's so I've got uh, Paul Kirtley's blog, which has been going for eight years now at paulkirtley.co.uk. Sure. Um, loads of sort of long form articles, short tips, podcasts, a few videos on there as well, video tutorials, some of which aren't on my YouTube channel. So definitely check my blog out. There's loads of free yep. resources there. Um, one of my passions is sharing these skills as you hopefully picked up yeah. working with Mike. No, it's been great. You know, I do this for the, the love of sharing the skills and keeping the knowledge alive. And, you know, it's been fantastic to share some of that with you, Mike, and to share it with, with your audience. So it's no, great. Um, yeah, really good. That's yeah. very helpful. If you guys uh, want to help Paul out, do go over to his, uh, his blog. I'll put a link in the description below. And also I'll put links to Paul's social media, his Instagram, and also his YouTube channel. Go and check it out, hit the subscribe button. Paul has a wealth of knowledge. He also has his bushcraft school, Frontier Bushcraft. This is a fraction of, of what you've seen here is a fraction of what Paul actually teaches. So I'll pop links to everything you need to know in the description. Thank you so much for watching this video and we'll see you soon in the next episode. And don't forget to check out my audiobook recommendation, Lost in the Wild. Head to www.audible.com forward slash TA Outdoors for a free audiobook and your free 30 day trial.